So a uh, great conversation teed up today. For those of you that, that, that don't know Greg, uh, Greg has really been uh, a pioneer in the mobile messaging and communication space. Uh, so we're going to get a look today at, at his new application, uh, his new messaging application, Pop Messenger, really exciting. But first, what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to hop in the uh, hop in the DeLorean. Uh, we're going to take a little trip back in time, and we're going to talk about uh, the evolution of Pinger and how Pinger's advertising and monetization strategies uh, also evolved with the times. Uh, so, uh, you know, we'll uh, we'll sort of learn a little bit about uh, where it is now and and some of the things that Greg learned uh, along the way. So I'm sure you picked up a few things here and there. I have failed at many things as we probably all in this room have. So, probably similarly. Yeah, so why don't we uh, why don't we go ahead and dive right in, Greg, you're the you're the founder and CEO of Pinger. Tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, your start and and why Pinger, why why mobile messaging. Uh, so like all good tech CEOs, I started in film school. Um, when I was in school, we were cutting film with razor blades and literally taping it together. It was that long ago. And uh, there was a computer lab because of a reasonably progressive, progressive school. And I could see what was going to happen to the slicing the film and taping it uh, because there was real-time processing of video and audio. And so I sort of gravitated towards computers, got into high tech, was with a couple of uh, successful, you know, well-timed startups. Um, the first one was um, right as Microsoft was going to introduce Windows and they were adding uh, sound and video to the to the personal computing platform. I happened to be with a company that had a sound card, and so there was no sound on PCs. And right. then one day Microsoft uh, enabled it, and then the next day we were at billion eight or something like that. So, and then I, I met the founders at uh, Palm, who had developed a product called the Palm Pilot, and they left Palm, and they had uh, they were anticipating a uh, open application layer on mobile phones where there's a persistent data connection. And so uh, we made a product called the Trio. Um, and we sold that. I went to go work for Richard Branson for a couple years. And I decided to start my own company. That was basically it. And we didn't even have a pitch deck, uh, per se. We had a series of ideas that we were going to go and, and, and try to innovate in. And we ended up with the guys at Kleiner Perkins. Um, we had an affinity with one particular partner there, a guy named Randy Commissar, great guy. And we said, let's iterate. And so we drew this box, which was a classic sort of, uh, there's four spaces in communication. And at the time, three of them were massive. There was synchronous text, and that was you know, IM, and it was text messaging. Um, there was asynchronous text that was, you could still write a letter and send it via the post office, it was email. Um, and on voice, there was a lot of synchronous voice products, but there was no asynchronous voice product. Now, people have been trying to do the same product that we failed at over and over and over. There was just another one, IDEO, great guys, smart guys. They just brought out an asynchronous voice. Apple just brought out asynchronous voice finally as part of iOS 8. Um, it was a mild success. Uh, we couldn't figure out how to monetize it. The problem with communication is, the last thing you want to do when you're about to try to communicate with somebody is say, but after this brief video introduction, you know, now you can communicate. And we just couldn't figure it out. Um, and so we pivoted. Um, we changed to something different. So this is, this is when you got into contact first communication, right? And sort of, sort of uh, opposite of, of you know, what Christian went through, you guys, you had gotten funding at this point? Yep. You had gotten funding at this point? Yep. Sort of no pitch deck, right? Knew the right people at the right time. Yep. Okay. No business model. Yep. But time for business model, right? Yep. Right. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So this was, you know, the iPhone came out, and we had already done. We knew that this was coming. You know, the the Trio was a smartphone that you could do email and web browsing, and it had an open application layer. And in many ways, it was the first. It was the definition of you know, Apple did it fifty thousand times better. Mm -hmm. But that was the future. Um, and so when Apple came out with the iPhone, we we're like, well, that's it. I mean, they did it, and, and this is going to change everything. And we went into communication specifically knowing that as, I, as opposed to I'm going to make a phone call, and that phone call is going to go hit a tower, and it's going to be in a proprietary circuit. It doesn't matter anymore. With a persistent data connection, you can move voice, you can move video, you can move uh, text, anything through that web connection. Mm -hmm. um, so we had an overreaching, overambitious, way too complicated product, and it was called Pingerphone. 
And the idea was is that if I wanted to talk to Brendan, I would just say Brendan, and then all my, my modes of communication would be made available to you. Um, and it, uh, we did okay. It was, you know, this is the first holiday in the iTunes store. So we spent a bunch of money. You know, we had it all ready to go. We, we were buying burst stuff. We were, we were doing everything you could possibly do at that time to try to throw something up the charts. Um, and this is when we learned that the store froze for the first time. This is like December 2008. And we're like, you know, we're spending hard and the thing's not moving. And we're like, we're stuck at number 30. And then like two days later, we're like at number eight. Number eight. And we're, what, you know, we didn't know what happened. And then we realized that Apple freezes the store because they had so much traffic. That's the peak of their, the, the store. Um, but we had experimented with advertising. So it was banner ads. Right. That was the idea. And what we learned here was that nobody gave a shit about this product. But what kids had figured out was that in the, the IM was part of this. And as the invite for an IM conversation, it was a text message. And it was a free text message. And we looked at data. We built lots of instrumentation in the products. And so we were looking at the data going, the engagement on the SMS invite is gigantic, or the IM invite is gigantic. And we went, oh my god, they're sending free text messages. Let's just do a product that does one thing and does it well, which is text messaging. And so we developed a product called TextFree. Great. And so and the data that you, that you looked at, did you use third-party data uh, metrics for that, or did you guys do all that? No, you know, we actually, there wasn't that big of an ecosystem at the time. This was pretty early, and we just had our own data. And so um, we looked at, you know, who was touching what inside the app. It was a reasonably well-instrumented app, and we had a whole data suite. We've always been kind of big on data. Um, and so the data was, was our guide. Um, we did pretty well with this, actually. It got up very high in the iTunes store. Uh, the data showed that we were close. We just didn't have the right product. Gotcha. So, uh, so free texting, right? So uh, increased advertising, yep. with multiple ad networks, uh, yep. and it's in your, you know, now you're up into the top five, right? Yeah. So this, um, so when we did text free, we, it just immediately went. It was like the IBM commercial where they launched their website and they're looking at it and it just starts to go and it keeps going and going. It, I mean, it just literally kept going, and it was the weirdest thing. There was one person doing texting in the store at the time it was a couple of guys out of Canada and they had grabbed this API that Google had left open and they were riding on this API to do messaging and he calls me like right we're just running up the charts I mean I think we're at number like 10 and it just keeps going and he calls me and he goes hey I, I can't remember his name this is so and so from infinite SMS and I was like uh, hi and he said uh, hey I, I got some bad news we just got shut down you know, and as an entrepreneur, you want to be like, oh, that's terrible. But he was my competitor. And I'm like, I didn't know how to react. It's like, that's terrible. And and how can I help? And he's, he didn't really have a way that I could be helpful. And so in the end, they went their separate ways. But uh, this, this product in particular had advertising from the get-go. And there weren't very many ad networks. So there was, there was AdMob. Mm -hmm. There was Google for mobile applications. Does anybody remember this one? Um, and we were one of the few people that were working with them at the time, and they were like, why don't you give some keywords? It was, they were trying to take keyword targeting and make it work in mobile. And so we gave them keywords like uh, iPod Touch case, because a lot of kids were using our, our product to turn their iPod Touch into a phone. And everybody bought a case with their iPod Touch. And so we had iPod Touch case, but what was happening is we were getting like trial lawyers for class action lawsuits that were like $12 clicks. And so the CPMs were insane. And so we had these insanely high, this is like 2009 or something like that, some, and the CPMs were like four bucks on banner ads. You know, it was, it, was, it was nuts. And that was on the free side. Then we had a paid product, and we had a really, really good conversion engine. We were converting about 12% of everybody who registered, and the registration rate of downloads was about 97%. So very, very high wow. conversion rate to paid. And they were paying $5.99 a year for unlimited texting. Yeah. Uh, so, so you started using multiple ad networks at this, at this point, right? Yeah. So is this the point where you started to get, you started to have that mediation discussion internally and sort of how are we going to manage all these networks? Well, we need to, we yeah. need to try mediation, right? Yeah. We, well, so people's SDK started breaking. And it was breaking our product. And so people don't use products that don't work especially communication products. If your product doesn't work, I mean, it's just, it's over. Yep. And by now, there were lots of, there was text me, text you, text them, text us, you know, there was yeah. a million competitors. And so the cost for switching was, 
except for the people who had paid, um, the cost for switching was very low, so people could just leave if your product didn't work. Right. So it was kind of a self-preservation thing. Uptime was a really, really big deal. And so we started looking at ad networks, and we started looking at them based on performance, and we started to build a really rudimentary mediation layer. Okay. So, and you're still using that uh, today, right? We still do use that mediation layer. It evolved, um, it evolved over time. Okay. And you tried, you tried some other mediation options at that point, I'm, I'm yeah. sure, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, it was actually probably in the next product that we really started to mediate heavily. Yeah. Um, but the problem was that, you know, stuff would break, mm -hmm. and, and that was that. And we started to have little uh, direct sales efforts, then we had house ads, you know, when somebody, they're not always connected to a network, especially if they're not on a phone. A lot of them were on iPod Touches things that just required Wi-Fi. So there was no persistent connection outside of Wi-Fi. So if they weren't connected, so there was always a house ad that showed up. So we had the house right. inventory we needed to serve. We had some direct stuff we needed to serve. Um, and then we had this third party stuff. And so how do you start to mix this all up together and not have your product, product break constantly? Right. And this is how we get into mediation. Great. So uh, the next point is probably coincided around the time my, my daughter would steal my iPhone and play this game, Doodle Buddy, and then yes. she's playing these stick wars. And, and yeah. you know, upon further investigation, uh, lo and behold, these are your applications, right? So these are yeah. Pinger applications. So you got yeah. more into publishing at this point. Well, we started to experiment. We were, we were trying to figure out how are we going to make money? How are we going to scale this thing? And we looked at a couple of categories, and you're like, OK, everybody's got a photo app, and everybody's got a drawing app, and then there's fitness. And so how do you, could you build a business by cornering the market to each one of these sort of, you know, got to have it app categories. Um, and we were still doing free to limit on text free, but we had just regular banner ads in there. We started uh, doing affiliate experimentation where we had this, uh, this hottest apps where in, in the, this is at the time where you would get a 5% rev share for 72 hours on anything that anybody bought in the iTunes store. So at Christmas, you can imagine if you drove stuff there, it was just giant. So we were we were profitable at this point. We were immediately profitable. Mm -hmm. And we were immediately making money. We had revenue, we had profit. Um, like, you know, net operating profit, not um, just, uh, we, we were making real money here. And what we learned here was that, um, that these categories were popular, but nothing had the engagement of communication. I mean, nothing. But what do people do most on their phones? They communicate right. more than anything else. And so that was the engagement. We were getting, you know, sort of uh, 40 plus minutes a day, 20 plus launches of the application. I mean, it just the engagement was insane. And the impressions that it was generating was one of the reasons that we were doing mediation, because we just couldn't get enough fill. We had to have multiple networks at this point just to be able to fill the ad inventory that we had. Right. Um, and so here's where mediation really came in. But what we, what we saw, we, we were successful with a lot of these apps. You can see they really, we were very successful with them. You just, it, we really struggled to make money in anything outside of messaging. Or I guess it was, there, there was, there was a lot more resistance. Um, it, was, it was just much harder. And it was the engagement. So, so did you get to a point where, I mean, you reached number one. So right now you've, you've gotten you know, top 30, top five, number one. Do you, you think you have the app store figured out at this point in time? At that point we did. And, yeah. the, and the, the, uh, the simple lesson is it was played back to me by one of my, uh, one of my uh, the head of another company that Kleiner invested in. He said, well, it's pretty easy to do what you guys are doing when you already have a, a number one app. You yeah. know, if you've got a number one, what's the key to having a number one app? Having a number one app. Right. If you've got an app that you can go to everybody yeah. and say, hey, everybody, go get this. Um, works like a champ every time. And so when you've got multiple apps, it, it, you could do that because it, you're not slingshotting an upgrade or whatever. You're telling them to go get something. And this was a very, very early instantiation. I would, we did this really early of native advertising. We dropped a message in your inbox and said, hey, if you like this, you'll probably like that. And it, it was insane. Yeah. I mean, we, were, we would get, of the people that would get a message, that if this was, you know, especially if it was our app, we couldn't convert other people like this, but there were times where we got 60% of the people who got the message opened it, and 35% of the people that opened the message went and did the thing that we were trying to get them to do. So the, the conversion rates were, were nuts. But in, in the end, we said, the publishing thing is best left to people who could be experts in each one of these categories. We're actually pretty good at communication. We're going to stick with that. And how important was cross promo? I think we, we probably have a lot of folks in the audience who have 
uh, a portfolio of, of, of titles, whether it's games or multiple applications? Was cross promo throughout your sort of network of publishing applications really important to you guys? That was the, the, yeah. that, that was that was the key. That was the key. That was the key. Yeah. And so if you've got one that's going, then you can promote the others, yep. and it's much easier to get them going if you've got the one. But if you don't have the one, you know, you're at square zero. Gotcha. So. Um, we're moving on to full-on communication, right? So, uh, so more features in your applications, mm -hmm. uh, more uh, more advertising, uh, more types of advertising at this yeah. point, right? Yeah. Um, so we really had a lot of. Uh, this is where, if you remember TapJoy, when you could, you know, use TapJoy on iOS, the guys that started TapJoy, one of them was an intern at Kleiner. Uh, Lee and so we knew Lee and we knew Ben and we thought they were just super super smart I remember One of the very Kleiner Perkins is good at getting all their CEOs together and they had a, uh, a Mobile summit of just the heads of the mobile companies and you know they, they funded Zynga early So it was you know it was a fair fair group of uh, entrepreneurs and there were a lot of people that had sort of pretty well-known track records in the room and they were all talking about you know, what Apple needed to do. And this is when like, Scott Forstall would come in and we'd get a private audience with him. And so everybody's slinging all this bullshit. And the one, the, there was one person in the room at the time that had a number one app, and that was the intern at Kleiner. And he was the only one that really knew the path to, to sort of get, anyway. Yeah. Uh, we were using TapJoy at that point so that people could earn minutes. Um, and those were minutes that they could use to talk. Right. Because minutes have real cost of goods to us. You have to pay CLEX. There's, you know, there's real cost. And we introduced phone numbers at this point, too. Um, and again, the, the user base continued to grow. Um, but we had you know, download offers. We had You could watch videos to earn minutes. Um, you could still buy minutes. Um, and we started to, to really experiment with sort of native um, inbox advertising. And, um, we, st we initially got people like The Gap. We did a, a Gap ad, and we started to brand it differently. Instead of just dropping a message in your inbox, we started to brand it from the third party. Mm -hmm. And up until that point, we'd only had real, real results when we were the brand um, and that people had an affinity for. And so we weren't sure what was going to happen. And so we did something with the Gap, and it was like Black Friday. It was a 50% off sale, you know, the most perfectly perfect storm. And it had like a 60% click-through rate, or 60% open rate and 20, 30% conversion. Huge, like as, yeah. as good as we've ever seen. And we're like, well, <laughs> that's never gonna fucking happen again. Uh, until we did the next one, and it happened again. Yep. And we did it with Macy's, and, and again, super successful. And that led to Nike, Adidas, and, and other stuff. Um, and so, uh, you know, if you look at where we are now, um, we're, we're only looking at, at things that are native. We've got the ability to, because people are generating content, they're good, generating words. Um, and most of the native stuff that we had done was about adjacency. I'm going to take this thing that you don't know, and I'm going to put it adjacent to this thing that you want to do in hopes that you're going to stumble over it. And the results were pretty good. Um, yeah, but, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. But we, 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 we tried a campaign um, that was a little out there uh, for Comedy Central, and the idea was that uh, they were launching Amy Schumer's show on Comedy Central, and Amy Schumer, Amy Schumer's pretty, pretty blue. Raunchy. And um, and so we said, well, what what if we what if when people were sexting, we could key on the words? Now we were we were already experimenting with highlighting words. Like if I said, hey, let's go to the movies. Movies actionable it would open up Fandango and it would show you what movies are playing. And that was really working. People weren't freaked out by it. They were sort of like, well, that's convenient. You know, want to go to dinner, dinner, bar, bar. It was sort of like, um, and we were really worried about people freaking out and they did not freak out at all. They actually kind of dug it. They're like, wow. Yeah. So we, we said, well, if they like dinner, then, you know, what about F me? Would that be good? <laughs> and so literally when we ran the campaign, somebody forwarded around the list of the top search keywords, and it was literally F, F you, F me, you know, dick, boner, tits. <laughs> it was like unbelievable. And we had to have this discussion with their, with their agency, like, well, you know, the boner click through rate was about 45%. <laughs> Sounds like a fun meeting. Yeah. Um, they clearly like boner more than tits. And, and so it was really, it was, it was surreal. Um, 
But instead of, instead of taking the, the, this message and putting it adjacent to it, we made the advertising come from the actual user content. Yeah. And so uh, that, that was pretty eye-opening for us. Yeah. And so trying to be more native um, is something that we're really focused on right now. Yeah, I love the way that you guys are doing it. That case study is by far the most entertaining one that I've, I've heard in a long time. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think if you, ask, if you ask, you know, 10 people their definition native, you're probably going to get 10 different <clears throat> definitions. And so, uh, you know, what you guys are doing, is not only relying on your content as sort of the backdrop, but using the user-specific data and actions as, yeah. as part of that native experience is, uh, is very cool and obviously uh, incredibly engaging and, and successful. As well. F me shows intent. And yeah, right. <laughs> I'm, I'm saying, I've, I've said that all, for, for a long time. Um, yeah, it should, you yeah. Know, we're, we're always looking for intent. What does That's the user right. intend to do? And is there something we can put, can we put some context around this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, that campaign certainly gave us context. And you're able to put that context around there too, so not just specifically those keywords, but really sort of put things into context. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and, and we tied in another native unit to it where there was an inbox ad from Amy, and I think it said, if you have an erection lasting for more than four hours, call me. Yeah. And you could you know, open up that message and then it clicked through to a microsite. And, and again, the results of this thing were off the hook. I mean, you know, 60 plus percent click through rates on day one, 20, 30 percent conversion rates. And people would go back to it multiple times. Yeah. So it really, um, it really opened my eyes to, uh, you know, my partner was, was the very first product guy at Palm, so he's very, very much in, you know, like, let's make things easy for the user. Let's not get in the user's way. Let's respect the user's experience. And I'm very much like that, too, which is kind of orthogonal to advertising generally because, especially in communications, you know, people, you guys have come to us for years and said, video, you've got to put some video in here. But, you know, when's a good time to watch a video when you're trying to make a phone call? Mm -hmm. um, only when you hang up, as it turns out, is it like, oh, there's kind of a convenient place. Right. Um, so we've really struggled to try to put advertising, I would argue that, this is as tough a category to put advertising in as there is. Because when do I want to stop doing what I'm doing to listen to your stupid fucking advertising message? You know, it, it's, it's very rare. So you've got to find those little moments. And we found that if you incorporated the advertising into the action, um, that that was, you know, that was the best route. And that's, uh, you know, that brings us uh, to POP, right? Yeah. And so that's your strategy with, with the new application. Tell us a little bit about, you know, POP. And the, the idea for Pop is simple. Um, everybody here sends text messages. Everybody uses the Android or the, uh, the native you know, iMessage. Um, maybe you use WhatsApp. Maybe you use WeChat. Maybe you use Kakao Talk. Maybe you use Line. It doesn't, I don't care what you use. They all look the same. Nobody can change their font. And it just, it, you know, it, it doesn't make any sense that we, hold on a minute. People love texting because it's fast and it's easy. But, but why can't there be any level of customization whatsoever? So is there a way to make it fast and easy and yet customize it at the same time? So we said, well, it's got to be fast, it's got to be easy, and it's got to be ubiquitous. Anybody can receive a text message. If I've got your phone number, I can send you a message. That's the beauty of iMessage or your sort of native client. So the idea with POP is the same thing. It is ubiquitous. If you've got somebody's phone number, they can get POP. They don't have to have POP on the other side. You can use it and you can send it. They get a message, you just have a cooler font and a different background. You can pull it from the web, you, you know, the background images from the web. You can change your color, you can change your font. Um, and so this is a little bit ambitious. Uh, we'll see how we do with this over time, but it's, it's uh, a perfect place for us to really start to focus on native advertising. And I would imagine that, that the only type of advertising you'll see inside POP is native. One, because it's, it's the most successful. Um, it's the most profitable. Um, the you know the CPMs that we see are in the you know 20 plus range, um, and it I think respects the I, I think it's a good experience um, built specifically for things like native. And so you'll see us do more and more and more with native, but always trying to say it's not enough to just stick something in in somebody's way. You know it's it's another thing in my news feed. It's it's trying to incorporate. Um, and trying to incorporate the advertiser as part of the conversation. Yep. 
Great. So I've got a few more questions, uh, but uh, I'm going to throw it out to the audience first um, to see if there's any questions uh, from you guys before we, uh, before we get moving on. I think they want to get to lunch. Any questions? Well, they can't yet. We have another panel, so they're... Uh... <laughs> no questions from the audience? Okay, so I, I still have a question. So at this point, and it's, and it's more around, uh, around the number of advertising partners you're using at this point, you know, yeah. back, back in Pinger. Um, those have obviously grown, right, as the market's grown and, yep. and the opportunities have grown and your traffic has grown. Uh, so, those, those have grown. What have you learned over the, the last, you know, six years of, of sort of testing partners? Is, is more better, sort of, is less more? Um, sort of what's your strategy around that? Well, um, it's not good to have just one backstop that all of your eggs are in that one basket. When Google finally went, wait a minute, you're, these keywords, people are like, these are legal ads. Like, you know, it was immediately disastrous for my revenue stream. It really hurt for my CPMs to go from you know, three bucks or whatever it was to, to 40 cents. Um, that hurt. So it's good to have a backstop. Um, and things like that, it's sort of hard to have a backstop, but it's, it's good to have a backstop. It's good to have multiple partners so long as you can manage them, so long as everybody's got a, uh, a reason to be there. Um, you know, competition is a good thing. I mean, um, if you want something from one of the two of us and whichever one of the two of us comes up with the better solution, then that's good for you. You end up with a better solution than maybe I or Brendan would have come up with individually. So um, having multiple competitors competing for your business is, is, is a good thing too. Um, the downside is, is that um, there's, you know, you've got to manage people and you've got to manage the technology. and um, there are, as you grow the complexity of a network, little things like latency become a big deal because especially in a, an application like ours where people are moving in and out of different portions of the application quickly, a little bit of latency will kill you. And all of a sudden, because you've got this network with some latency and this network with no latency, you've got 30% more or less impressions and it can happen like that. Yep. And so there's a lot of complexity that comes into building the network as you get more partners. So as long as you can manage the complexity, you're good. Great. I just got the two-minute warning. Uh, if, you could, if you could change one thing, um, what would it be? If you could do one thing over, since we have the DeLorean anyway. We well, we had, we had two competing apps in 2009. One was meant for the worldwide market, and you had to have it on the other side to send a text message. Mm -hmm. um, and then there was one in the US where we would give you a phone number. And the one in the rest of the world was growing. But it wasn't growing as fast. And it's a classic, we didn't really look at the data deeply enough. We went, this is growing much faster. We're making money. Let's go with this. Right. Uh, we took investment from um, uh, mobile operators, from T-Mobile, to move towards the infrastructure. And we really kind of knew better, like, carriers, you know, it's just a bad idea. Should we be doing this? I would have gone the other way and stuck with the product that we had originally because that's what my buddy Jan sold you know, WhatsApp for, for $20 billion. The real value in messaging was not in the US, it was outside the US because there was an economic benefit and the economic benefit was gigantic to the rest of the world. There is a benefit to a smaller audience in the US, I, I don't have a phone, I, I need a free phone number, um, but worldwide, that would be great. I think there is an opportunity today for us with something like Pop um, if we can capture people's imagination to go, well, it doesn't really matter what kind of message you use, they're all the same. Yeah. And shouldn't you at least be able to change your font? Yeah. So. Great. Um, great. Well, Greg, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank um, you. I think that's about all we have.